On that note, Aki, would you like to open us up in prayer? Yes, Ak, that's no problem. Hallelujah. Our hearts and minds um, on the throne of the Most High. Father, we just thank you, Father, the Most High that sits between the cherubim. Father, who has a rainbow around his throne and fire from his waist down and has all of the uh, 24 elders around you and uh, the four beasts around you, Father. And we just thank you, Father, for your majesty. And we just try to come to you, Father, just and um, just humble as we can. Father, we know we probably um, have have sinned against you. And Father, we ask for those sins to be cleansed of us right now, Father. Um, sins of transgressions, Father. And even the things of our forefathers, but, you know, the, the mistakes that they made, Father, just we repent of that. And Father, most of all, we are sorry for how it's made you feel to be uh, rejected, just as you told Samuel when we wanted a king, that they weren't rejecting Samuel, but we were rejecting you. But Father, tonight, we we do not come with that mindset to reject you. We come, Father, for your Ruach to lead and guide us into all truth. We thank you, Father, for the teacher, the moderator of this class, Father, uh, 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 a mighty servant, one who loves to serve you, one who loves to look into your look into your word, Father, one who loves to um, uh, just uh, eat this word, Father, and he loves to share it. We thank you, Father, for the Ruach HaKodesh being upon his household. May he ask peace and blessings over his wife and his daughter, his mother, all of his family, his Mishpaka, Father, everyone on this call right now, Father, I just uh, ask peace and blessings, Father, for Obadiah, Patrick, Anaya, uh, Elizabeth, and Dre. Father, I thank you, Father, for these faithful souls, Father, and I pray, Father, for them to get something from this, Father, that will help them um, throughout their day, throughout their week, something that they'll always remember. Great teachings, Father. They stick with you. Great, great moments, Father, that you prepare for us, Father. And Father, I just thank you, Father. I ask that all of us come to this tonight with a desire to hunger and thirst after righteousness, Father, that, um, and that, you know, when you said when we were hunger and thirst after righteousness, Father, we'll be filled. We thank you, Father, for this night. We thank you, Father, for this time to come together. And thank you, Father, for the presence of your Ruach HaKodesh. We thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth, our high priest, our king, Yahushua, our Father. And most of all, Father, we thank you, Father, for your infinite wisdom, power, your presence, Father, and your understanding. And um, Father, we just thank you for this kingdom that you've allowed us to be a part of some kind of way. We, we found you, Father, but we know it was because you loved us first. And we ask all of these things, Father, in Yahushua's name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. Hallelujah. Great prayer, Aki. Hallelujah. 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 As we get started, I told our Rabbi for everybody coming, um, anybody who may come in a little late. Um, we always just thankful for the most time what he's doing and allowing us to go through this and compare and contrast and you know when we first started this first book we ever did was Enoch and we always said at least the original ground rules of this was this is not to necessarily um prove any um theory or thought of the scripture right or wrong it's the purpose of this is to build up on what Yah has given us um and so far we've been doing a good thing I think everything we've read um we have all we read. The first two books of Enoch, we read the Testament of Solomon. Um, I think we read something else. I can't remember. Um, first two books of Enoch, we read the Testament of Solomon. And we might have went right into Jasher. But all of it, we have been able to, or I take that back, for forgive me. Yah has showed us um, the importance of what he was trying to show us in all of these things. Um, Enoch was educating us. Solomon was educating us on um, what to look for, what not to be attached to. Um, and once we break it down, as Yah has increased our knowledge of his word in general, um, to be able to go into the language and to be able to define words and, and so on and so forth, because all of that plays. Um, as we read these things, we realize that as um, you know, some things are, are harder to see, you know, but
But as Yah has increased our knowledge in the scripture, we say Toda Rabba for that because he has made a way for us to um, be able to go in righteously um, with his discernment and not our own and to bear things out um, for the validity of them, but also for what it is that he is trying to show us. And we've seen a multitude of things. And I think tonight is going to be kind of the same. So we've made it through um, <clears throat> Yosef has revealed himself to his brothers down in Egypt. He's given them all these gifts and different things like go back and get your cob and bring the house down here and we're going to hold it down in Egypt, basically. I've been put in this position. Yah, you know, he told him he forgive them because he realized Yah put him in this position to help his family, help the world, but to help his family to save the, the this, this bloodline, this blood covenant family that Yah has chosen. Um, and now they went back, told Yacob, yourself alive, he's really king, um, sent them back with all his splendor, and the whole story was just, you know, we've come a long way. And when we ended last week at verse 110, it says, and Yacob made a feast for them for three days. And all the kings of Canaan and nobles of the land ate and drank. So everybody, which they would, being that it was a famine. So if Yacob got enough to make a feast, I'm sure everybody would come, even if they was, even if they wasn't completely on board with them. It's like we can't turn down no free meal either. But I'm just kidding when I say that. But everybody came. All the kings of Canaan and the nobles of the land ate and drank and rejoiced in the house of Yacob. He's about to go down to Egypt. And we know this is where um um, this is an interesting time amongst the Israelites because as he gets down here and they start to pass on, we start to see servitude forced up on our people. I don't know if we'll get that far tonight, but as we start Jasher chapter 55, verse one, um, I go, I seen you came in here. You free to do a little reading? Yes, I am. You can start Jasher chapter 55. Okay. Jasher chapter 55, um, verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Jacob said, I will go and see my son in Egypt and will then come back to the land of Canaan, of which Elohim has spoken unto Abraham, for I cannot leave the land of my birthplace. <laughs> So hold on, hold on. As we start, your cold initial thing was, I'm going to just go see my son in Egypt, and I got to come back to Canaan because Elohim has told Abraham, you know, this is where the covenant is. This is y'all land. Um, and then we see a difference there between him and Esau. Remember when we went through Esau, Esau disregarded the covenant of Yah all the way up until um, Yitzhak or Yitzchak died. Remember when they went to the funeral of Isaac, Yacol presented it to him again, even though he had sold him the birthright and didn't want nothing to do with it. Yacol presented it at the death of, of, of Isaac. You really the firstborn. All is yours. What do you want? Esau said, just give me the money. I don't care nothing about the covenant and the land and all them prophecies. But now we see the difference of what it's supposed to look like. Yacol is taking that serious. I'm going to go see my son who he's been missing for. We broke it down. It's been, what, 21, 22 years? No, it's been... It's been 12, 19, yeah, 21, 22 years. Um, but he's showing the seriousness of, I got to get back. This land was promised and we need to, you know, whatever y'all need me to do, I need to be in this land. So first off, that's interesting that he didn't have plans to stay in Egypt. He was planning to come back. Verse two. Uh, yes, and behold, behold, the word of Yah came unto him saying, go down to Egypt, our misery with all thy household and remain there. Fear not to go down to misery for I will there make thee a great nation. And Jacob said within himself, I will go and see my son whether the fear of Elohim is yet in his heart amidst all the inhibitions of uh, Miss Hari, uh, inhabitants, I'm sorry, 
of, of Missouri. And, <clears throat> and Yah said unto Jacob, Fear not about yourself, for he is still retaineth his integrity to serve me, as will uh, seem good in thy sight. And Jacob rejoiced exceedingly concerning his son. At that time, Jehovah commanded his sons and household to go to Misrin according to the word of Yah unto them. And Jehovah rose up with his sons and all his household and went out. Uh, and he went out from the land of Canaan, from uh, Beersheba, with joy and gladness of heart. And they uh, went to the land of Egypt, of, so, of Mitzrayim. Hallelujah. So we see Jacob didn't have plans, but then y'all told him, no, you go down there and stay, because I got a plan for y'all. And I'm going to make y'all a great nation down there, right? Um, <clears throat> um, Jacob was curious, like, okay, Yosef then rose to second in command here in Egypt. Um, I hope he hasn't broke commandment to make it here because um, they don't know the story yet, right? And y'all let him know, no, nah, he all good. He didn't do what he's supposed to do. Um, I'm going to make you a great nation here. You going down there to stay. This is where you're going to be. I don't need you in the land. Um, as we know, he told um, Abraham in Genesis, the, 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 the wickedness of the Amorites had not been fulfilled. I'm paraphrasing. I could be saying that wrong, but we see that y'all still on a time different than our own. But it's still good that Jacob is showing that um, that servitude, that energy of servitude to where he like, no, nah, I got to get back. But y'all like, no, nah, I need you to go down there because I'm going to make a great nation of you there. So it leads to believe once again, because we know that the servitude of us that came on in Egypt, um, Moses, Pharaoh, all these things are yet to come. And Yah, is, and Yah really is already just told him a prophecy. Now, he ain't tell him how it's going to go. <laughs> But I'm going to use what's going to have to take place in Egypt to make a great nation of you. He really just prophesied to you, Cole. Hallelujah. Verse 6. Huh? And it came to pass when they came near Mesodim, Jacob sent Yehuda before him to Yosef uh, that he might show him a uh, situation in Mesodim. And Yehuda did according to the word of his father and he hastened and ran and came to Yosef <clears throat> and they assigned for them a place in the land of Goshen for all his household and Yehuda returned and came along the road to his father and Yosef harnessed uh, the chariot and he assembled all his mighty men and his servants and all of the officers of Misrin in order to go and meet his father, Yaakov. And Yosef's mandate was proclaimed in Misrin, saying, All that do not go to meet Yaakov shall die. And on that next day, uh, Yosef went forth with all Misrin, a great and mighty host, all dressed in garments of fine linen and purple and the instruments of silver and gold and with their instruments of war with them. And they all went to meet Yoko with all sorts of musical instruments with drums, timbrels, shrewing uh, merit and uh, aloe all along the road and they all went after this fashion, and the earth shook at their shoot at their shouting. And all the women of Misery went upon the roofs of Misery and upon the walls to meet Yoko, and upon the head of Yosef, Yosef uh, was Pharaoh's regal crown. And for Pharaoh has sent it unto him to put on at the t at the time of his going to meet his father. So even Pharaoh understood how big a deal this was to him. 
And I think it's interesting that it talks about all the women of Mitzrayim in Egypt or all the women of Mitzrayim went up on the roofs of Mitzrayim and up on the walls to meet Yaakov. The reason why I think that's interesting is because we've already seen and we kind of, you know, I laughed at this last week, but I, it's, it's funny, but I'm serious, too. The way that uh, Potiphar's wife was acting about Yosef. Um, and even when she brought the women of Egypt to her, they was like, what's wrong with you? And she was like him. And they said that they cut their hands and all kind of stuff went on with them looking at the beauty of Yosef. And this was him as a servant. And um, hearing that all the women went on the roofs and all that, it makes me think about them seeing all of his brothers coming. Um, uh, and and the effect that that may have had upon the women of Mitzrayim. Verse 11. And when Yosef came within 50 cubits of his father, he alighted from the chariot and he walked toward his father. And when all the officers of Mitzrayim had put their nobles uh, and her nobles saw that Yosef had gone afoot toward his father, they also alighted and walked on foot for Yaakov. And when Yaakov approached the camp of Yosef, uh, Yaakov observed the camp that was coming toward him with Yosef. And it uh, gratified him, and Yaakov was astonished at it. I remember when he told Yaakov the dream about all of them bowing to him. He said, so what are you saying? That your mother and me and your mother going to bow to you as well? And he did that in front of the boys because he seen the tension. But if I'm not mistaken, it said that he never forgot and he was astonished at the dream. So when it says that he's astonished here, in my mind, I see Yacob replaying that dream. And he's like, you know, y'all really did this, <laughs> you know? Now he, he not only did my sons have to go bow to him when they was going to get this food, but all of Egypt has come with him. Like that, it affirms that dream that Yaakov was astonished at before. Verse 13. And Yaakov said unto Yehuda, Who is that man whom I see in the camp of Mesurim dressed in kingly robes? with a very red garment upon him and a royal crown upon his head, who has alighted from his chariot and is coming toward us. And Yehuda answered his father saying, he is thy son, Yosef, the king. And Yosef rejoiced in seeing the glory of his son. So now it says that he's coming with kingly robes, very red garment, with a royal crown up on his head. Um, and that almost reminds me of a, like um, in second Ezra, where it talks about where it's like, it's a very tall boy amongst them. And Ezra asked the angel, who is that? And he said, that's the Messiah. And he was putting crowns on everybody who had dipped their, their, their garments in the blood of the lamb and been cleansed. And um, he was talking about um, salvation, so to speak. And as you were reading that, I see, um, Yakol being a picture of that, but not being crowned by Pharaoh, but by all of us who, who, um, as we submit to Yah and grow in the word of Yah and, and correct more and more of ourselves every day, this is the moment we're looking for to be put in heavenly garments, um, with crowns placed up on our heads, uh, by the Messiah. I just see a picture of that in that verse 13 that you read, but verse, verse 14. All right, you know what? we'll hold on for a second right there. If anybody got anything to add, um, any questions or comments or anything um, on this so far as Yosef and Jacob are meeting for the first time in 20 plus years. <clears throat> um, I think uh, it gave all of them time to reflect uh, that in the prophecies that uh, Yosef had given when he was just a young boy, uh, he wasn't being pretentious. His uh, heart was clear and his, uh, um, well, his mind was clear, his heart was pure, and he was just uh, reiterating 
uh, what uh, the Holy Spirit had given him. And they, they were able, they all together were able to see uh, that he was pure in thought and indeed, and uh, not trying to uh, lord over them at any time. Hallelujah. And you know what? I, I agree. Um, and to your point, um, he's already started that process with his brothers when he told them, like, you know, don't even worry. I was using me for this because realistically, he could have been like, y'all was bogus. I told you I wasn't lying. You know, he could have been cocky about it, to so to speak. But even in the moment of being right, he was still humble in the approach of, you know, y'all don't beat yourself up over this. Y'all was using me. And, you know, we're going to, you know, he the, the way he was interacting with his brother, he was still playing a humble servant. Although he could have been like, I told you so. And y'all sold me because of these dreams and been lying to my daddy and woo woo. -woo and yet, he played right. that role of what you just said, a pure heart, humble servant. Um, and the things that you just said, I agree. That was a good point. Uh, hallelujah. Praise you. You can continue. And Joseph on. came nigh unto his father, and he bowed to his father. And all the men of the camp bowed to the ground with him before your code. Think about how amazing that was. Um, said he took said that he told everybody in Egypt, if you don't come, that you will die. It could be, you know, that could be a million people just bowed in front of your cove. Like, you never know. It could be more. It could be less. But still, it was it was to see a large crop. You know what? It's funny that we just read that because, and I'm sure some of you see it, um, it's that picture they always show from Mecca where that black um, stone square type of thing is and all them people when the Muslims go to Mecca they bow in front of that thing and they're like praising around that thing. Uh, you know, I know some Muslims try to act like they not bowing in front of that thing because they really in there worshiping the idol. Unless you saying that that, that stone box is God, that's really idolistic. Right. Um, but that just made me come to mind. Cause when you see it, you see like all these people in that big temple. Um, and it just made me think of the way these people came and bowed in front of Yacob. Naturally, he's not an idol though, but they look up to Yosef. So if he's the father of Yosef outside of Pharaoh, this has to make him a, a great, mighty man, a king as well. Verse 15. And behold, Yacob ran and hastened to his son, Yosef, and fell upon his neck and kissed him. And they wept. And Yosef also embraced his father and kissed him. And they wept. And all the people of yeah, yeah, Mizraim uh, wept with them. Hallelujah. And Yehov said unto Yosef, Now I will die cheerfully, after I have seen thy face, that thou art still alive and with glory. <laughs> and the sons of Yehov of and their wives and their children and their servants and all the households of Yaakov wept exceedingly with Yosef, and they kissed him, and they wept greatly with him. Mind you, he was 18 when he left. Um, he was Jacob's last son to be born. Um, by the time he left, some of his brethren may have had these wives and some of these children. He might have knew when they was babies, too. Um so, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, when you ain't seen somebody in a long time, I'm going to assume that some of these people, maybe not all these children and all these wives, but he was probably still around for some of them. Um, so I could see them weeping, especially the ones who actually knew him when he was a young boy. Or a young man, I should say. Verse 18. And Yosef and all the people return afterwards home to a missing and Yacob. <clears throat> And the sons and all the children of his household came to Yosef to Mesut, to Mizarin, and Joseph placed them in the best part of Egypt, in the land of Goshen. Hallelujah. And Yosef said unto his father and unto his brethren, I will go up and tell the Pharaoh, saying, My brethren and my father's household and all belonging to them have come unto me. And behold, 
they are in the land of Goshen. And Yosef did so and took from his brother in Reuben, uh, uh, Issachar, uh, Zebulon, and his brother Benjamin. And he placed them before Pharaoh. And Yosef spoke unto Pharaoh, saying, My brethren in my father's household and all belonging to them, together with their flocks and cattle, have come unto me, uh, unto me from the land of Canaan to sojourn in Egypt, in uh, misery, for the famine was sore upon them. And Pharaoh said unto Yosef, Place thy father and thy brother in, in the best parts of the land. Withhold not from them all that is good, and cause them to eat of the fat of the land. And Yosef answered, saying, Behold, I have stationed them in the land of Goshen, for they are shepherds. Therefore, let them remain in Goshen to feed their flocks apart from uh, the Mesoranians. And, and Pharaoh said unto Yosef, Do with thy brethren all that they uh, shall say unto thee. And the sons of Jacob bowed down to Pharaoh, and they went forth from him in peace. And Yosef afterwards brought his father before Pharaoh. And Jacob uh, <laughs> came, bowed down to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and he then went out. Jacob and all his sons and all the household dwelt in the land of Goshen. In the second year, that it that is in the hundred and thirtieth uh, year of the life of Jacob, Joseph maintained his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their uh, little ones. All of the days of the famine, they lacked nothing. Now, and Joseph, hold on, real quick. So we gotta. I'm gonna write that down too. So it just gave us a date. Uh, I think that's important. It said in the second year, in the second year, which was the 130th year of the life of Yaakov. I think that's important to write down as we count these years they were actually in Mitzrayim. And that actually just gave us a date. It was the second year of them coming. It was the 130th year of the life of Yaakov. Hallelujah. And he let them know. According to the little ones, all the days of the famine, they lack nothing. Hallelujah. Yosef holding the family down, just like the dream said he would. Keep going. And Yosef gave unto them the best parts of the whole land, the best of Misarim had they all the days of Joseph, uh, Yosef. And Yosef gave also, also gave unto them and unto the whole of his father's household, clothes and garments year by year, and the sons of Jacob remaineth uh, securely in, in misery all the days of their brother. And they show you how much money all his, all his corn, grain, slash whatever else they may be had that they were selling was worth, that he had it to give, because this is a big truth. It counts, I believe, 72 men. When we read this story in Genesis, if I'm not mistaken, it counts 72. Let's see here. Let's see. 45, where it talks about, let's see, it talks about a long way. Anybody know where it's at? Where it's, oh, right here. So in Genesis 46, it tells us the names of the children which came into Egypt. Um, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Anak, Falu. It's telling you all of these, but it don't say any wives. It don't mention all these servants they got. Um, I think it counts 72 here. It's a lot of them. One to be remembered is the sons of Levi that came were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. 
and we know Koha is and see the Moses's father or his grandfather. Which one? What is Kohath to Moses? One of you know. Um, I think it's I think it's Amran's dad. That's Amran's dad. So that's I'm Moses. Thinking, I'm, that's what I'm. That's what I'm thinking. I don't. I, I have to go back and look at it. I think you're right. So that's his grandfather. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's important to get the date down too. But um, the point I'm making is is. Um, to have garments and all of that in the best of the land and this land that he gave him, he had to give him some immense because this is only naming the children. Like I say, it's not talking about the wives. Um, it's not, it, it, it's not talking. About, and I think only, only, only boys are named here. Um, and no, I named some girls here as well. It doesn't name all the servants, but it's a lot of them. And I know right here it names 70 something souls. Um, as it tells us at the end here, it says, and the sons of Yosef, which were born in Mitzrayim, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Yaakov, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. That's 70. But right here, like I said, it's not naming servants. It's not naming wives. They were deeper than this, than just 70 souls. Um, just to get it, just to try to put a, a face on what he's going on. So when it's talking about these clothes and these garments year by year, that's speaking directly to how profitable Yah has made Egypt in this time of famine um these clothes and these garments that they got they they've been selling a lot of stuff to a lot of the world and we know they're dealing with barter everybody ain't coming with gold and silver some people is coming to trade garments trade rugs trade um vessels and, and craftsmanship um um maybe even trading cattle i don't know how the cattle will be faring back in their lands where these families that but this is this is a this is a big deal that he's telling them. Goshen would have been a very big plot of land, and these clothes and his garments would have been a big deal in Egypt too to be given to the sons of Jacob and their families. Right. Hey, Shalom, Ak. Go ahead. Ak, you know, uh, I was just going to say this real quick. If you were to look at the the Nile, you know, River Delta, right? That was where the Goshen Goshen was. Yeah, it was on the it was in the most fertile. It was on the most fertile place. I just wanted to mention that. Most definitely. And I, I, I'm seeing, I, we'll see as we go forward, but you are correct. Um, it was considered, possibly considered the most fertile place in Egypt. Um, and I think it's a correlation there with, with them being given the most fertile place, even though they're in Mitzrayim, which also represents the house of bondage. Not to them yet, but we know that that word represents the house of bondage. And I think it's a correlation to him to Yah making it so that he can give them the best of the land, no matter where they're at. And in my mind, I just see a correlation to where as we stay faithful, as he told Yaakov, don't worry about him. He just stayed faithful and held it down where he'd been. And as we do that, as me and the Ema were talking earlier about looking for a house to buy and things like that, as we just work on seeking the kingdom and staying faithful, Yah will give us the best of the land wherever we are too until we go back home. I see a correlation, but it's, it, it's not coming to view yet, but. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. This it, this this is that's the right way to, that's the right way to look at this story. I think it's, 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 we go into, we're coming into becoming a nation and, you know, uh, and then we're gonna be being gathered again to be a nation because the one thing that I really wanted to mention about, you know, Yosef being back together uh, with the other brothers is that's the one stick so we've got the one stick right here together you know in the in the land it's not two sticks you know it's one stick so that's where we have our real power because we know who we are and we know whose we are you know at that particular point you know Most definitely. and ain't no animosity yourself did away with that in the door when he was like y'all was using me for this y'all don't beat yourself up over because i'm sure you know They've been watching you cold, crying, all that. I'm sure it was some tension, but Yah used him even to diffuse that, like you say, to become that one stick. There is no animosity here amongst the tribes. Verse 28, Ak, if nobody else has anything. And Yaakov always ate at Yosef's table. Yaakov and his sons did not leave Yosef's table day or night, besides uh, what you Jacob's children consumed in their houses. And all the Misreen ate bread 
during the days of the famine from the house of Yosef for all the Mesoranians sold all their belongings to them on account of the famine. So that explains why they got all these garments and all of that, because not only is the world selling everything, even the Egyptians is doing that. So, and Pharaoh has allowed Yosef, he said, you know, everything you get, that's on you, just hold it down. And I'm sure he kicking some, you know how it be with these governments, he's kicking a nice portion up to the king's coffers as well. But, um, and Yosef ain't greedy too. All this wealth that he's accumulated here, Remember when we broke down the 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 the, the weight of the silver and gold that um or it might have just been the gold don't don't quote me but when Yosef first got the position they said that he gave him a gift of x amount of gold and I believe silver and when we broke down the weight based off today's currency he gave him a billion dollars worth of gold slash silver so um also remembering that Jacob is already rich he didn't got rich in the house of uh, Laban before he left. Um, he didn't get any money from his father who was rich. He let Esau take the money because he valued the covenant more, which was worth more than money, most definitely. Hallelujah. But um, I think that should be spoken too, um, because we live in a time now to where our people, just speaking here in America, to where um first off, our people here to on average, not even talking about the awakening, just our people on average here. First off, our people don't even believe that we can govern ourselves. That's a but B, that's why our people lean, a lot of our people lean so strongly to the American government, because government, we have been here so long, a lot of our people don't even believe that we, ever, we were ab ever able to establish our own government and, and govern ourselves. That's A, but B, we've been in survival mode for the last few hundred years to where our people don't even understand, like you have, especially amongst young people, you have a lot of people who talk about raising kings and queens, but they're just kind of drawing that out of thin air. And right here, we're actually seeing what our people really come from. And we really do come from, um, and even before this, because Abraham was royal, but just speaking for this moment, um, Shem was royal. All of our people were royal. But just speaking for this moment, um, it shows something that we come from, which is much greater than this second exodus, this second captivity has put a mentality into our people to where um, it's hard for a lot of people to even believe that these would have been their ancestors because all we know is servitude, slavery, slash captivity. So I also see a picture there of me and painted, but verse 30, if ain't nobody got nothing. And Yosef purchased all the land and fields of Mesodine for the bread and uh, for the bread on the account of uh, Pharaoh. And Yosef supplied all uh, Misarim with bread all the days of the famine. And Yosef collected all the silver and gold that came unto him for the corn which they uh, brought throughout the land. And he uh, accumulated much gold and silver besides an immense uh, quantity of onyx stones, uh, Belgium, and uh, <clears throat> valuable garments, which they bought unto Yosef from every part of the land when their money was uh, spent. Hold on, I <clears throat> now. We read this in um, so we did this this week. We as we're on the Shabbat for those of you who are on it with us. We've been going through the book of uh, Isaiah. We are in chapter nine, and it talked about how. What was this at? Or it talked about how all of the right here it was verse five and we read this verse five so isaiah chapter nine verse five says for every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire and um i actually believe this is one of the verses that was maliciously changed because when we read this in the septuagint 
And we we go to the Septuagint, and, and me and Mark Obadiah had a really good conversation about the Septuagint. I'll probably explain this again this Shabbat. But the reason why we go to the Septuagint for the Old Testament is because if you know the history of the Septuagint, and, and that's why I study history and, and things like that, if you know the history of the Septuagint, in the time of the Maccabees, when the Greeks were in control of the land before the Romans conquered it, we'll say 250 years before the birth of the Messiah, right? One of the Greek generals sent to the temple, the second temple, which was still there in Jerusalem at the time, to Eliezer was the was the so was the um priest at the time, and he's one of the descendants of the Maccabees, I believe. Well, it refutes a few things. I can see why all of that story was taken away from the scripture too, because when he sent to him, he told him at the Alexandrian Library, which is which is what they used to call one of the seventh, eighth, whatever wonders of the world, it burned down. I think when me over died, looked it up, it was like 60 BC, it burned down. I guess the Romans probably did it as they came in. But the Greeks were, especially the Athenians, you know, when you get to talk about Socrates and, and Plato and um, um, I can't even think of all of their so-called um, thinkers because they really weren't thinkers um, or philosophers. But be it as it may, they were respected in that world. And the Greeks were known to be trying to go around the world and collect history, heritage, and knowledge. The same thing the Europeans do today, which is why the British Museum has all of that historical fact from around the world. Same with the Louvre in France. Same with the museums in Italy, um, the ones in Rome and the Vatican Museum. They have a bunch of history from around the world, so they still follow that suit today. Anyway, when he sent to Jerusalem, the priest picked six scholars from every tribe, which shows us that in the time of the Maccabees, before the Romans came in, before we get to the time of the Messiah, when the rest of the, our tribes are, are a little bit more scattered and they like, we don't go to the temple and mess with, um, I wouldn't say they don't go to the temple, but they was kind of like, we don't mess with the Yehudians because the Yehudians be acting funny, which fits today because the Yehudians today be acting funny with the rest of the tribes, meaning these awakened African-Americans. When you hear African-Americans in, in his walk talk, a lot of them, they talk like about Africa and the other tribes like less than, and that makes sense to me because they were doing that in the time of, the Messiah as well. That's why he told that woman at the well, I ain't like them. <laughs> Be that as it may, though. It refutes the fact that some people think that the tribes have all been scattered and that's why they all call Gentiles in the New Testament and blah, blah, blah. The reason why it refutes that is because all the tribes were there, or at least in the area. And this high priest, he sent to the tribes, he said, send me six scholars from every tribe. And he sent them to Egypt, to this Greek general, who asked them to translate would have would have been scripture at that time into Greek for them. That's why the name Septuagint means 70, because six times 12 is 72. He sent 72 Israelites, real Israelites, not these people who claim to be Israel today. At this time, this would have been bloodline descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Yacob. And they went and translated it into Greek. So, and at, by the time of that, around 250 BC, you would have had, um, the Apocrypha would have been in there outside of the book of the Maccabees. I don't know if that would have been written, but like Judith and um, Baal and the dragon and the prayer of Manasseh and all of that would have been there. Ezra would have been there. Um, Sirach would have been there. Um, all of what we consider the Old Testament, uh, Malachi, all of that would have been there. And those Israelites went and translated it. And I was telling Nakobadiah. It's believed in 60 BC that when that Alexandria library burned down, that that original Septuagint was in there. Now, when they got it, they translated it to other books and was sending them back to Greece, to Athens, to their library. They, I wouldn't be surprised if we, if, if you really looked it up, that they over there in Greece, they may have a very close to the original somewhere in Greece still. Point being, though, that's why we go to the Septuagint for some things in the Old Testament, because the Septuagint would, would predate the King James and the Septuagint would predate the Masoretic text, which the King James was taken from, which if you study the Masoretic text, it was part Hebrew, part Aramaic is what they call the Masoretic text, what they made what we call the King James. And sometimes, I believe in the, and, and this is my opinion, but sometimes I believe that there's translation error, translation error in the KJV 
And sometimes I believe the translation error is just because the language of English can, is not a grand enough language to grasp the ideal of some of the Hebraic talk. I really do. But then there's other times where I feel like they maliciously change things. And this is one of them times. And we went through this on Shabbat. This verse five in KJV says, for every battle of the warriors with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And this will make sense when we get back to Joshua. I know I'm going in a roundabout way, but in the Septuagint, that same verse says something different. It says, for they shall compensate for every garment that has been inquired by deceit. Talking about the enemies of Israel. And all raiment with restitution. And they shall be willing, even if they were burned by fire. And we understand that. When we left Egypt the first time, they gave us everything. It talks about the second exodus, how the world is going to give us everything that it owes us. Which is everything. <laughs> which is everything. So with that being said, when you were reading this, this Jasher, verse 30, and Yosef purchased all the lands of the fields of Egypt. He owned all of it for, for bread on the account of Pharaoh. And Yosef supplied all Egypt with bread all the days of the famine. And Yosef collected all the silver and gold that came unto him for the corn, which they brought throughout the land. And he accumulated much gold and silver besides an immense Besides an immense quantity of onyx stones, bedlam, valuable garments, which they brought unto Yosef from every part of the land when their money was spent. And that Isaiah played that chapter nine, verse five, because when the boys died, and we're going to see this when we go down, I believe it states this when you get to the part when they go into servitude. The Egyptians came through amongst their descendants. And I don't believe the Egyptians put us in, and that's why this dates is important. I'm going to try to timeline this up as we go through this. First off, none of the 12 sons of Jacob were in servitude. I don't believe none of their children was either, none of their direct sons. Because I know Ephraim and Manasseh wouldn't have been. I don't believe none of their direct sons were. I believe the servitude started with the grandchildren at, at, at the earliest, maybe the great-grandchildren of them, right? And it details, I believe in this, when we get there, how when the Egyptians started to do that, they came and took all this gold and silver. They took all these garments. They took all these stones. They took a lot of that land, that good land. And, you know, the, the, the good things, even though we still stayed in Goshen, they took a lot of this. And this Isaiah 9, 5, for they shall compensate for every garment that has been required, acquired by deceit. Because we know that when we left Egypt, Yah made them give it all back. That's the point I'm trying to get to. Anyway, verse 31 of Ain't Nobody Got None. Hallelujah. Good talk. And Yosef took all the silver and gold that came unto his hand and about 72 talents of gold and silver and also onyx stones and medullum in, the great, in, in great abundance. And Yosef went and concealed them in four parts and the concealed one part in the wilderness near the Red Sea. That's interesting. In one... Go ahead. Excuse I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And one part by the river uh, Pereth. And the third and fourth part he concealed in the uh, desert opposite to the wilderness of Persia and Media. Me That's interesting as well. So these places where they say he concealed them, that's interesting because we know that we're going to come through the Red Sea. We know that eventually we're going to end up with amongst the Persians and the Medes as well. Um, so I just think that's interesting. I'm not sure exactly where Parath would be. Um, I'm not exactly sure where this would be. No, definitely. Oh, it's putting Perth. No, definitely not Western Austria. I mean, you never know. You got some Israelites now who might be like, yeah, we were sailing that far, man. Yosef had some of that gold buried in Austria. You just we're never know. know. <laughs> Maybe, that, I don't know, but I don't know where that place is at. What you said, Obadiah? Would that be uh, the river that encompassed uh, Ethiopia, the Blue Nile? It could be. I, I I don't know. I just can't. I don't know. Let me see something. Because I know that that part of the story isn't told um, in the Genesis account of this. It didn't be it was not a, that elaborate of um, this wealth that was accumulated and how it was going. 
Um, it talks about the, him giving them the land and I think even the garments, but it does not talk um, that elaborate about um, like right here, 47, 14, and Yosef gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Mitzrayim and the land of Canaan for the corn, which he bought. And Yosef brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So he just say he brought it there, but he, he, he spread some of that money out amongst his brethren. Um, and when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Yosef and said, give us bread for why should we die? And Yosef, you know, it talks about how Yosef got the cattle. Um, but it does not go that elaborate and it definitely does not talk about him hiding this money sure. um, all over. So I don't know. I, that land, it could have been what you just said, though, most definitely. You came, y'all. See your hand. I... Yeah, I think it's, um, they're saying this to Euphrates, man. I don't know, man. They're saying that's the, the Parathas, the Euphrates. Possibly. I mean, now, how can I say yeah, this? That's what they're saying. They're saying it's 65, Strong's number 6578. And they said it's a river of West Asia. Um, it means to break forth, rushing. And uh, the river Euphrates is what they're saying it is. Oh, I don't know. It is. Oh, yeah, well, I'm yeah. willing to yield on that Blue Nile. I mean, I was, it was only... Uh, a summation in my mind so i'm not hard on, on, on that no to to your point though obadiah i think this works towards this point though um whether right or wrong because i have not looked far enough into it to say but there is debate about amongst the awakened where the holy land really right and one might could surmise that this is speaking towards it all being more down into Central Africa in that region. Um, the way he spread this money maybe would be closer than to go as far as one could think. Um, so th this could maybe speak that way. Um, like I say, not even whether right or wrong, because that's not nothing that I've looked far enough into it to have an opinion of right or wrong. But this could speak towards. Um, Ethiopia and down in the Sudan or wherever, because I don't even know exactly how people place this, but I know there is debate in the community about the placing of this. And this kind of maybe um, could speak to that. But, uh, and I think it's funny that it says a, a river, and as you said, in, in West Asia, because they always call Northeast Africa West Asia, which would still be the same thing. It's just in a different position of the continent that we know to be called Africa, which ain't even the real name of that, and that's European, and we ain't even gonna get all into that. But the, whatever the case may be, I think it's interesting that wherever he took this to, that we don't get much mention of it afterwards. And I think that's by the father's doing, so that um, people wouldn't spend their lives looking for this and not looking for him. But Moving on, unless anybody has anything else to add to that. That's a good point, though. Both ways. Verse 32, Ock. And he took part of the gold and silver that was left and gave it unto all his brothers for unto all his father's uh, household and unto all the women of his father's household. And the rest he brought <laughs> unto the house of Pharaoh about 20 talents of gold and silver. Now, see, in the Genesis account, it said that he took it all to Pharaoh. And we see here saying that he took some unto his brother's household. So uh, it makes you wonder. That's one of those things that make you wonder. Um, I can't even remember what I just seen. Oh, 17, no. It was a little further down where it said... <laughs> Uh, I'm not even sure exactly where it was just that, but it said that he took it all to Pharaoh's house. So we see a difference. He took what was left to Pharaoh, um, which I remember calling when we did this with Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't have a demand to give him all his money. Pharaoh was kind of just more like, yeah, save my people. But I'm sure he did kick something up to him. But moving on, verse 33. And Yosef gave all the gold and silver that was left unto Pharaoh and Pharaoh placed it in the treasury, and the days of the famine ceased after that in the land. 
and they sowed and reaped in the whole land and they obtained uh, their usual quantity year by year. They lacked nothing. Mm -hmm. And Yosef dwelt securely in Mizraim and the whole land was under his advice. And his father and all his brethren dwelt in the land of Goshen and took possession of it. And Joseph was very aged, advanced in days, and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, remained uh, constantly in the house of Yehoah, together with the children of the sons of Yehoah, their brethren, to learn the ways of, of Yah and his law. And Jacob and his sons dwelt in the land of Mizraim, in the land of Goshen, and they took possession of it, and they were uh, fruitful and multiplied in it. So Yah's letting it be known that they we were doing really well down there before this servitude. Um, and it speaks also to a different type of servitude than we, this captivity, this, as we got on ships, as the scriptures say, to come into this servitude here, because there's never been a time here when we've had a Goshen. Um, and it was fruitful and multiplied and, you know, like a plot set aside for us to do that. Now, some people have had many Goshen's where they've been able to be fruitful and multiply, but it's never been like that on the nation side. I also think it's interesting that because I know there is debate also about the servitude. Did the sons of, of the kids start to act more Egyptian and, you know, and Yah was punishing them and, and yada, yada, yada. Um, but we see here that it said Ephraim and Manasseh remained constantly in the house of Jacob, together with the children of the sons of Jacob, their brethren, to learn the ways of Yah and his law. So our people knew it as well. The offspring knew it. Jacob's grandchildren, um, which shout out to Jacob because he probably was standing on make sure these kids know the ways of Yah. So um, I think that's interesting going forward as well. But. Any questions or comments, anything anybody want to say before we move on to the next chapter? And thank you, Ak. I'm, I'm going to pick it up from here. Thanks again. Anything anybody want to add to this, right? Uh, just this chapter, what chapter is this? 55, um, before we move forward. But we, 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 I'm just trying to show that it's, it's setting up the, you know, it's setting us up for what's about to come. Shalom, Shalom, Mark. Um, yeah, you know, had, um, uh, uh, a Cody Mirror had shown me something about it. Um, you know, it's in, um, it's, it's, it's really not really clear. I got to go back and look at it. Well, it's clear enough, but it's in um, e Ezekiel chapter 20, where um, it shows that we were, something happened to us spiritually in, in um, something happened to us spiritually in Egypt. And a lot of people say, well, you know, we got just put into captivity because we got too big. But, you know, um, I think we uh, started picking up some of the abominations of their eyes. I think that's what it's saying. And um, you can probably go to Ezekiel, let me see, 7, um, 20, verse 7. Then said I unto them, cast ye away every man, the abominations of his eyes. Where do we get those from? And, def and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. But they rebelled against me and would not hear, hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. You see that? You see, there's a, we, we, we are in the midst of the land of Egypt. When you know, and I think that's when the father turned the captivity, turned it into a, 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 bond, a bondage. You see what I'm saying? And, you know, so that's that's just a, another reference verse to people. Some people, I, I I got into a debate with Ak uh, about. He says, "No, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't do anything wrong to deserve the captivity there." And I don't know if you look at these verses, you can probably see something in it that we were. We knew about the idols, just like you see that they're sitting together with Yaakov to learn about Yahuwah. You know, it's a whole lot more people that get bigger and bigger. And it's a house is harder to control when you get more and more, you know, population. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to control. I just wanted to, I just wanted to bring it up for anybody that ever wanted that. That verse is uh, Ezekiel 20 uh, uh, talking about that we had done something wrong with idolatry in Egypt. 
Hallelujah. And to your point, I think it's letting us know that the children, the grandchildren were on point, but as you get further from that, and as you say, as it gets bigger, um, some of y'all down in Egypt started to go a different way. Hallelujah. Anything else anybody got for this before we move forward? Hallelujah, chapter 56. Jasher chapter 56, verse one says, and Jacob lived in the land of Mitzrayim 17 years. And the days of Jacob and the years of his life were 147 years. So we see now 17 years would have been, because it said that he was what? 130 in the second year. So we would be have been down there 19 years now. 19 years. And that's right. Kind of timeline this up exactly. How did when did this servitude start? But at that time, Yacob was attacked with was attacked with that illness of which he died, and he sent and called for his son Yosef from Mitzrayim. And Yosef, his son, came from Mitzrayim, and Yosef came unto his father, talking to, about to Goshen. And Yacob said unto Yosef and unto his sons, "Behold, I die." And the Elohim of your ancestors will visit you and bring you back to the land, which the Most High Yah swear to give unto you and unto your children after you. Now, therefore, when I am dead, bury me in the cave which is in Machpelah in Hebron, in the land of Canaan, near my ancestors. And Yacob made his son swear to bury him in Machpelah in Hebron. And his son swore unto him concerning this thing. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Sarah was buried along the roadside. Not Sarah, Rachel. Leah was buried in Machpelah. Is that, is that correct? Mm. Um, Can I go back to see? Yeah, um, let me look it up real quick. I'll... Yes, I believe. I bring that up because understanding that his father and his father's father was there as well. But I think it was something to be spoken that he wanted to be buried where Leah was as well. Cause he could have said, bury me where Rachel went. I think it means something that he, uh, that I could be wrong, but I think it means something that he wanted to be buried where, where Leah was. Yeah, it says even though she was buried in the bounds of the land, and we're talking about Raquel, um, uh, even though she was born in the, in, in the bounds of the land, she was um, um, she was not born in the in the in the double in the double in the double cave or the double portion. That's I think that's what Machpelah means. Exactly. So she wasn't born there, but it's it's like you know, um, it's it's something about um. You know, it's something about that being Abraham's bosom or something, you know, like the entryway or something. I don't know. I always think about it. You know, if you're going to be a bird in the cave where Abraham is, you know, you know, that's where you want to be. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you got any kind of request, you know, but um, and I, you know, and we know that there's a little bit of controversy at the end of um, um, Rachel's life. She was born in the land. She was buried in the land, but there's a little bit of controversy with her. May yeah. the most high rest up. May the most high rest us. So it doesn't mean anything that significant. I do believe that she's, she's Ema is there is in the eternal in the eternal uh, life with us. I think she's going to be there. But um, but yeah, Hallelujah. No, and to to the point, on Genesis forty nine thirty one says there they buried Abraham, or Ibrahim and Sarah, his wife. There they bury Yisca and Ripka, his wife. And there I buried Leah. So she's there. Um, I don't know how significant or, or how big, but I think it's, I think it's, because he could have said, go bury me next to where Rachel at, you know? But I think, yeah. it, 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 I think it's significant that he's buried where not only his ancestors is, but also where he wanted Leah to be buried at. I think that means yeah. 
isn't that the script? Isn't that the there's a scripture they say that she's buried outside of that Rachel is buried outside of Bethlehem. Isn't that a scripture that talks about Rachel cries for her children? Yes, we uh, so yeah, it's it's I think that has something to do with you know, of course, it has something to do with how long she was uh, she was she had baby number 11 and baby number 12, son number 11 and 12. And of course, she was in mourning for all of the other 10 births, mm-hmm. you know. And so, you know, I think it's got something to do with that. But, you know, it may have something to do since she was born and she was she was she was buried in uh, right outside of Bethlehem, the house of bread. It, you know, it, it's, it's got something to it's something to it. I, you know, I, I just feel like it's something to it. If you just went down and looked at it a little bit tighter, mm-hmm. you're like, OK, I see what's up, because why are these prophets talking about Rachel crying for her children? You know, because I think the crying for Ra- Rachel crying to have these children, I think it was immense. I don't think it's anything that anybody could the way that Yaakov had to go through that with her. I know it was something else see 10 sons born before she had her babies mm. man it had to be something else true mm-hmm. i think it was Hamashiach who said that about rachel as well i don't even think it was as a prophet i think he said rachel cries um but i we, we'll find it in a second but yes Jacob told them to bury him in mac where leah was well, excuse me, where Abraham was, where Sarah was, where Yitzchak was, where Ripka was. Bury me there. Made him swear. And he commanded them in verse 5, saying, Serve the Most High Yahuwah, for he who delivered your fathers will also deliver you from all trouble. And Jacob said, Call all your children unto me. And all the children of Jacob's sons came and said before him. And Jacob blessed them. And he said unto them, The Most High Yah, Elohim of your father shall grant you a thousand times as much as you as much and bless you. And may he give you the blessing of your father, Ibrahim, and all the children of Yaakov's sons went forth on that day after he had blessed them. So he blessed all the children. And think we seen with Isaac. Uh, um, I think that was probably in his mind, too, here. This battle between him and Esau for this blessing. And instead of him making it a thing like that with his child, with his children's children, um, he just blessed them all at the same time. And on the next day, y- Jacob again called for his sons, and they all assembled and came to him and sat before him. And Jacob on that day blessed his sons before his death. Each man did he bless according to his blessing. So he blessed all his sons. Behold, it is written in the book of the law of Yahuwah appertaining to Israel and we know that um yes he's blessed he starts to bless them all over oh, is it chapter 48 do we bless them all here I think he might uh let me bless that day so oh 49 so 40 48 and 49 is where he blesses his sons verse 8 and Jacob said unto Yehuda I know, my son, that thou art a mighty man for thy brethren. Reign over them, and thy son shall reign over their sons forever. Now, when you read the 12 patriarchs, which is supposedly the letter from Yehuda to his children upon his deathbed, he speaks about how as a younger man, I want to say, that he had already seen in a vision or a dream. I know Levi had. Don't quote me on that, but it was known that he was chosen for the kingly line of the, of the nation of the family of Israel already. So um, I don't believe that when Jacob is telling him this at his death, this is the first time he's heard this. He's affirming this, I believe, to him. But be that as it may, um, he says, and all thy sons shall reign over their sons forever. You're going to be the kingly line and the scepter won't leave you, as the scriptures say. Only teach thy sons the bow and all the weapons of war in order that they may fight the battles of their brothers who will rule over his enemies. Now, this is how we got here. Uh Um, Oh, where is it? That's 1 Samuel. Um, It is 1 Samuel. That's when he died. 
And King David says that. Um, what is that? This is chapter 30. Um, let's see, where is that book? Damn it. Is it on Second Samuel one? So Second Samuel chapter one, verse 17. And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul, Shaul, and over Jonathan, which I believe to be Yahakanah. Yeah. Yo, no, yo, Yehonathan. Um Yahuwah given his son. And in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 18, also he bade them teach the children of Yehuda the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. And now we see why he did that. Because when Jacob says that, now this is, I don't believe this is in the Genesis story when Jacob blesses, um, um, and I'll bring that up. But now we see why King David said that at the death of Saul, because he was saying that then Shaul, if I'm mistaken, was from the tribe of Benjamin, the king there. Is that correct? Or was he from Yehuda as well? No, Shaul is a, ben, a Benjamite. He was a Benjamite. And the reason why David is saying that at his death is because he's saying, this is what Jacob told us to do, to know the bow, to um, fight the battles of our brothers who will rule over their enemies. And uh, and it's funny because it just gave me a new perspective of him saying that it's almost like King David is feeling like that's his fault because of what's going on, having going on with Shaul. It, had all that not happened, he would have been there with him in battle and maybe he wouldn't have died. Um, is that fair to mm -hmm. say what I just said? I think so, man, because, you know, um, you know, that's man, that was really just like I think that uh, uh, Jonathan and David were closer than um Jesse's sons were to um, um, David. Yes. I mean, you know, and just, you know how you got friends that rock real hard with you. You love your brothers, but you know, I mean, you know, and um, and of course, you know, he, he even wanted to take care of uh, of Jonathan's, you know, uh, uh, crippled son. You know, he wanted to make sure that he had a place at his table for the rest of his life, you know. You know, so um, Jonathan had a son that was, um, had been dropped, right? Had he been dropped with a child? And uh, he was crippled. So he made sure, David made sure his son was going to be at his table, you know. Oh, had a real comp right. We really had a real complex name. I can't think of his name. You are Real correct. complex. You real are complex correct. name. I remember, and it was after a while, he was like asking his people, like, is this something I ain't did? And they was like, well, you know, Jonathan got a son still. And David was like, oh, get him to the king's house immediately. <laughs> Most definitely. And he was, he was like um, lame or whatnot. But we see now why that's here. Um, why David, why it was mentioned, also bade him teach the children of Yehuda the use of the bow. Behold, it's written in the book of Jasher because we see that when Jacob said it, he's like, teach thy sons the bow and all the weapons of war, not just the bow, in order that they may fight the battles of their brethren who will rule over his enemies. And interestingly enough, with David saying that there, after he goes to do with Bathsheba, he spent the rest of his life fighting the battles of his brethren. Yep. Verse 10. And Jacob again commanded his sons on that day, saying, Behold, I shall be this day gathered unto my people. Carry me up from Mizraim and bury me in the cave of Machpelah as I have commanded you. Howbeit, take heed, I pray you, that none of your sons carry me, only yourselves. And this is the manner you shall do unto me when you carry my body to go with it to the land of Canaan to bury me. He said, y'all sons can't carry me. Y'all got to carry me. My 12 boys, I'm commanding y'all, y'all got to carry me up there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yehuda, Ishakar, and Zebulon shall carry my, ba my beer, buyer at the eastern side. Which makes sense because the east is how an Israelite would look forward and Yehuda being the king, representing the kingly line, you will be there. Reuben, Simeon, and Gad at the south. Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin at the west. That also makes sense 
because we know that the West represents a turning away from Yah because the East, that East in Hebrew also represents the ancient path. And once we get into the land, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin is the three tribes included with Dan, but they are like the three main tribes that break bad on the word of Yah. When we get into the land, when you read Judges, the Benjamin, the Benjamites, they raped the one priest's wife um, who was like, no, nah, we ain't gonna stay in the city of the Jebusites. We gonna stay where his Israelites at. And then he went to a city of Benjamin and they was acting like it was Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we know Ephraim and Manasseh as the 12 tribes are at the northern, 10 northern kingdoms are falling. Ephraim and Manasseh, we've been reading in Isaiah, we in chapter nine, Ephraim and Manasseh has been mentioned multiple times as like the head of that falling off that's going on up there. So it makes sense that they would represent the West because to an ancient Israelite, looking towards the East was like looking towards the ancient path, looking towards the head of something. And to be looking towards the West is like looking backwards, backslide, falling backwards, looking away from the path of Yah. Be that as it may, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali at the North. Let not Lewa or Le Levi carry with you, for he and his sons will carry the Ark of the Covenant and see how it was already known. And this is what I'm saying. He was letting it be known. It was already known that the, 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 the Levitical line was going to be chosen to have a job. And Jacob is saying it here. Le Levi can't carry me because his sons, him and his sons, they're going to carry the Ark of the Covenant of Yah with the Israelites in the camp. Neither let Yosef, my son, carry, for as a king, so let his glory be, howbeit Ephraim and Manasseh shall be in their stead. So, and that's interesting that that's there because before Yah even breaks up the land and says that it was going to be that, it was known amongst the brethren how this was going to go. I think that's, I think that's an interesting point. 14, thus shall you do unto me when you carry me away. Do not neglect anything of all that I command you. And it shall come to pass when you do this unto me that the Most High will remember you favorably and your children after you forever. And he did. He constantly had mercy on them. When we get in the land, the time of the judges and things like that, y'all was constantly sending judges and different things to free us out of the servitude, to free us out of what our wickedness was leading us into. Yeah, he did have favor upon his people all, all the time. And you, my sons, honor each his brother and his relative and command your children and your children's children after you to serve Yah, Elohim of your ancestors, all the days. And we know Moses says the same thing. When he comes through, he's like, and Yah tells them, tell them to teach this word, teach these laws to their children and their children's children, at least they forget them. So, even that, now we see that even that was a quote when Moses is writing that. I know he put it in Deuteronomy. He might have put it in Exodus as well. Even that's a quote of Yacob telling them, teach y'all children this. Also, he's telling them, teach them to serve Yah. It also lets it be known, because I know this is kind of sometimes spoke about, that it may not be in stone tablet or book form on scroll, but there was laws of Yah already before Mount Sinai. And he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. And Jacob is like, make sure y'all teach y'all children these laws. You came, y'all see your hand up. Yeah, shalom, Mark. I was just um, looking at the uh, the trap, the, the camp setup. I just, and this is exactly how um, it's exactly how Jacob wanted everybody to line up. Interesting. So that's the, so that's the, that's the setup, and he is the he is basically where Levi is. So they're carrying they're carrying the priest. And you know, and I would assume oh, that that's the that's the most important role that we wrote that we have is, you know, we're gonna carry these priests. And these priests, you know, is gonna make that intercession between the Most High, you know, because we didn't have these priests, man, we wouldn't even really be able to deal with Yahuwah, man. He gotta have people that's just completely set apart where they just they ain't out here doing everything that the rest of the sons are doing, you know. Hallelujah. You know what? Interestingly enough, you are correct. I didn't think about that, but. And we discussed it in here. Jacob is representing the last of the Melchizedek priesthood right here as well. From Noah to Shem, mm -hmm. Shem mm -hmm. down his line to Eber, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Mm -hmm. I and mean, not long after this is going to go to the Levitical priesthood. And we know the Levites in the middle were around the Ark of the Covenant, which set the mercy seat, which we know that the cloud of the, 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 the pillar mm -hmm. of fire 
and the cloud mm-hmm. by night rest, which was the is mm-hmm. spiritual representation of Yahushua, which is the high priest. He is the last um, um, Melchizedek priesthood, the high priest for mm-hmm. heaven. So that was a very good point that you just made. You this thing, this book, this book, this book is something else, ain't it? Ain't this, ain't it something? It is. And you know what? This is why, prime example, what you just did there is why we can't allow nobody to tell us what's canon. Because that was the Ruach HaKodesh that put that on you to say that like that. And if a person who does not have the Ruach HaKodesh, and we ain't going to get to saying who do and who don't, but you can't trust that nobody do. You can only move knowing what Yah has done to you because we don't know all these people. So somebody may tell us something is, is not. <clears throat> and in a lot of cases, we know that it's been Roman popes um, from Italy who has decided what is canon. And unless we can say that we know that they were inspired and had the Ruach HaKodesh of Yah, then he could never tell us that because he could never make that correlation that you just made. Yeah, hallelujah. You know, hallelujah. I, I, I also uh, just want to, you know, say that, you know, um, like even if we got a um, a text that's got the, fo- the Most High's name taken out of it, which I think the, the Most High wanted his name taken out of it. You know, he wants us. He wants us to. He wants us to be the ones to put it put it back. He right. wants us to be the one who um, remember the stranger because you were once a stranger. See, we know what it feel like to be an outcast and to be a sojourner. You can't, you don't need to explain that to none of us. Mm-hmm. We already know that. So, so you know, um, the father just been let, we've got a history of that. We have a heart towards this thing. And, uh, you know, I just think it's just a beautiful thing because you know the temple represents the body. Know you not that your body is the temple of the most high. And then that's why Yaakov was resembling that, you know, and Yaakov wrestled to get a blessing. And so we all are wrestling to get a blessing. That's what we doing, man. We wrestling to get a blessing. And that's that's the beautiful part because he gonna change your name. Change your name, you know, because you're gonna get a different name and a little white stone. Um, you know, even after all of this, everything's gonna be changed. Even I think the most high's name's gonna be changed. So um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And even with what I just said, even in this awakening, even within this community, you can't you can't sit around and assume that nobody has the Ruach HaKodesh. That's why we are to be led by the spirit, because you just never. Um, you just can't assume it and you never know. There are some people who are really good with the word who may, as it says, and, and I say this respectfully, not directly at nobody. But the scriptures tells us that the devil comes as an angel of light. Like you even may look at him and think he was called because <laughs> he was at a time, but he ain't no more. So. We have to study to show ourselves approved. We have to search these scriptures and let the Ruach HaKodesh lead us because only the Ruach will lead you to make that correlation that you just made. And that's a prime example of, see, and that speaks different. See, so this story may not be in Genesis, but what you just said, it spoke to a whole nother level of just reading. You know what I mean? And only the Ruach mm-hmm. HaKodesh can reveal scripture like that. And only we can rely on now, we can build with each other, and that's why this ain't about proving right or wrong, but mm-hmm. we have to do this work. We can't just allow nobody to tell us what he is and what ain't canon, because what we mm-hmm. have in the King James Bible, that canon has been through a lot of hands of non-Israelites who told us that that was canon, so we could never just accept that. Now, that ain't saying that that ain't enough, though. Mm-hmm. You could never just accept that. And and I think on your on your on this wise, the Father gives you the, gives us the fruit of the Spirit, and we all know people that have these general ca- characteristics. Some people are just like Anias, and she says she's full of joy, right? You know, it's it's love, faith, joy. You know, uh, long suffering, gentleness, goodness. You you can if you can't see this stuff, uh, temperance, being able to have control. You know, if you you should be able to see these things in the teachers, the people that you consent to listen to, that you're going to study behind. You should see these things. These are things that's not, they're not, they're very tangible things. They're, they're gentleness and goodness. It's just not going to be something that you can fake the funk with. Mm-hmm. It's just not something you have to pray to get that. And of course, you know, there's steps how we, we, we get immersed. And then the father says after that, you, know, you get to Ruach HaKodesh, which leads you to all understanding. And it's got, it's got evidence of it more in your character and the things that you just won't 
you won't do and things that you will be and things that you aspire to be. You know what I'm saying? Which are the things that the, that, that Yahusha had. He had the Ruach without measure. You see everything in him all of the time in full operation from the master teacher. And that's why when you listen to him and you can study behind him and just kind of think about the people hating on him all the time, every day, somebody getting up hating on him, but he had these fruits of the spirit. And, you know, and he never really changed the way that he felt about anybody. He just didn't, it was, it was, he was just so consistent, so consistently tove, you know what I'm saying? Just a really, really beautiful person. And, and you, when you see him going through all of these machinations with people, people trying to grab him, we want to kill him, and he done heal people. And some people um, have to leave a city because people don't have no faith. They ran him out of Gadarenes after he healed Legion. I mean, it's just all kinds of, it doesn't make any sense that he would go through that. And he had all of the fruits of the spirit. And anybody that was around him could see it. They had to be able to experience that. You know, I just, it's just really weird, you know, but hallelujah. Oh, true. And, and back at this verse 15, Something else that just stood out to me, it says, and you, my sons, honor each his brother and his relative. And we see that today um, amongst our people as a whole, um, we don't honor each other, our brother, our sisters, or our relatives. We are from that slave mentality of survival mode. It's all about the crab in the barrel, the dog eat dog, survival of the fittest, be better than the next. And this is also a command that we have lost. Um, just to get a few more of these before we go, because we're not going to finish this, but verse 16, in order that you may prolong your days in the land, that was part of prolonging your days in the land. And we know when we read the prophets and all that, we stop doing this, right? You and your children and your children's children forever. When you do what is good and yasher or upright in the sight of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to go in all his ways. That's how we prolong our days in our land. This is how we get back to the land. Verse 17, and thou, Yosef, my son, forgive, I pray thee, the prongs of thy brethren and all their misdeeds and the injury that they heaped upon thee. That's the first time you called, let it be known. I knew them jokers was tripping. <laughs> That's the first time you called, let it be known, man. I knew that they was foul, but forgive them. And we know Yosef already has. But Elohim intended it for thine and thy children's benefit, which is what Yosef told his brothers before they even went and told their father they seen him. But hallelujah. And oh, my son, leave not thy brethren. This is also why, and I, I had this conversation with, with a few different people on occasion. This is also why um, I won't call it wrong because it was more petty and it wasn't enough to really wrong me, right? But this is why when different situations have arise with different Israelites, male and female in this walk, this is why I still pray for people because A, people not really close enough to wrong me for real to me um, that I've met along the way in this walk. And B, I'm a firm believer. I don't believe in coincidence. So I'm a firm believer that everything that happens, Yah is using it to put us where he needs us to be. And this is also why we pray for our people, no matter what done happened. Now, if somebody done slapped your mama or something, that's different, but ain't nobody in this walk doing that to nobody because, hey, we ain't even, most of us ain't even in the same spot with each other for none of that to even take place. So the things that have went on that you may look at, like, you know, with a side eye, like, I don't know what they own, it's really just a lot of chatter, gossiping, maybe even being some false talking about you, but it's not strong enough to where I'm cursing you to hell. And I'm praying for you because I believe every time y'all removes me or any of you from a situation, he's putting you where you are needed, where he needs us. Um, so I firmly believe in that, that Jacob said to Yosef as well. Verse 18, and, and oh, my son, leave not thy brethren to the inhabitants of Mitzrayim, neither hurt their feelings. For behold, I, I co-signed them to the hand of Yahuwah. I consign them to the hand of Yahuwah. We know the hand of Yah to be who? The Messiah. That's who does the work. That's who Yah shows his power through is his only begotten son who we know to be the Messiah, the Lion of Yehuda. And in thy hand to guard them from the Egyptians. And the sons of Jacob answered their father saying, O oh, our father, all that thou hast commanded us, so will we do. May Elohim 
only be with us. And that's crazy that it was that because we know that that is Emmanuel. May Elohim only be with us. I think it's a lot of symbology and prophecy in that, what he said right there to them as well. But he commanded yourself, make sure these Egyptians stay in order. Um, and we know that the Most High Yah is going to guard them as well. The sons of Jacob answered their father saying, oh, our father, all that thou hast commanded us, so will we do. May Elohim be with us. So they said that they would have, and they did. His 12 sons, they did. And like I said, I believe that their sons did. I and mean, that's why we're going to timeline this, because I know at the earliest, the grandchildren, but definitely by like the great grandchildren, it's going to fall apart. And that's why I said what I said about Kohal being Moses's grandfather, because it's showing and people ain't living to be two, three, four hundred no more. These people starting to die. Yosef going to die one ten. We see in Jacob dying at 147, and I think all his children die younger than him. So the, the, the timeline of these years of living is getting lower and lower. So Hohoff ain't living the 400, um, Amram either. So uh, we're within a 200-year period of the servitude coming here, and we'll figure that out as we get there. But I'm going to end with verse 19. And Jacob said unto his sons, so may Elohim be with you, Emmanuel, when you keep all his ways. That's something for us. Hey, Emmanuel is with is Elohim is with us when we keep all his ways and turn not from his ways, either to the right or to the left or the left and performing what is good and upright in his sight. And mind you, to perform what's good and upright in Yah's sight, you may be out of sight of any human. And what he's saying is, is even when ain't no human eyes on you, Yah's looking, always do what you're supposed to do. And we're going to end this right there. Hallelujah. If there's anything anybody else want to add or any questions or anything before we go, this was a really good uh, read. And thanks again, Obadiah, for reading for us. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I like that verse, man, because it says what, what is, is, it's in Yah's sight. And that's also, you know, a little acronym. LSC, the law, statutes, and the commandments is what is in his sight. So, like, you know, just like um, you got children and your children want to, you tell them to do something before you, you tell them to do A, B, C. When you go to work, they did A, but they did X, Y, they did X and Y, and you didn't ask them to do that. So, you just want them to do A, B, and C. You know, you don't want them to do X, Y, and Z. And so, that's kind of things like, you know, we want to know how we want to pay the most time back. You know, just no law, statutes, and commandments, man. That's what. That's what. That's how you show them you love them. You know, and it's you know just little things, man. Treating people right, thinking about people right, really, because <laughs> we know how to treat people right. We know how not to do stuff, but we're just thinking about people the right way. That's where the work is. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And that's that's and do it and do it, do it when ain't nobody looking. Um, same mm -hmm. charity. Right. We don't do charity because people look um, not saying that you shouldn't write it off on your taxes. If you go make a big donation to something, you can write it off on your taxes. That's fine. But don't do it for that. Do it when ain't nobody looking because it was on your heart. Y'all put it on your heart to bless somebody and you were in position to and you did it because you cared. You know, do it when ain't nobody looking. We live in a world now where if you if you notice when it comes to these celebrities and these so-called quote unquote rich people, Everybody's a philanthropist now. Why? Because it's profitable to be known to be to be thought of as somebody who gives. They ain't just doing it because they care. Um, and you always see that unravel um, after a while. But hallelujah. Anything else anybody got before we get up out of here? It's been a good read. I enjoyed it with y'all as usual. As we prepare our minds and shalom. Shalom, Ak DJ and Shalak, uh, Aki Yahusha. I see both of y'all. I didn't get to tell y'all shalom. <sighs> As we prepare our minds and our hearts to get us some rest tonight, we just thank Abi Yah for bringing us together once again and, and opening up his word, um, letting his Ruach HaKodesh guide us and not the opinions of, of men, all or any men, on what we should be using to follow you, to study you, to learn of you, y'all. Um, 
I'm thankful that you put it on our heart to even start these Tuesdays because it's so much that you've opened up to us um, in a way that I know that only you could. Um, we thank you for choosing us for that understanding because we know in your word that it talks about kings and princes have searched for you and you've never allowed them to see. Um, with so many people on this planet, you have chosen us um, and not just us, but you have chosen some to be able to see, to see further than, to read between the lines, to see the levels of scripture, whether it be with spiritual eyes, physical eyes, the timeline, the history. Um, and we know that that's a blessing, Abiyah, because they can't teach you in schools. Um, and we know that that's you allowing us that. I pray that you continue to let your Ruach HaKodesh lead us all in all of our studies, lead us all in, in all things that we do, and in the searching and seeking for you and to seek your face. Hallelujah. I just pray that your Ruach HaKodesh leads us all. Uh, I pray for Akoti, Elizabeth, and everybody else on the call that we are able to get some rest, Abba Yah, that you refresh our bodies, refresh our minds, continue to renew our hearts and, and, and forgive us of our sins and, 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 and have mercy on us, Abba Yah, as we try to make a, a, a better offering every day to give to you, an offering of shalom, an offering of giving thanks with our lips, with the fruit of our lips, as it says in, your, in the book of Hebrews, an offering of our time when we are able, um, you know, whenever we get free time, Abiyah, not to spend it all in, in frivolous things and worldly things, but to set aside time um, to search your word, to search your scriptures and to learn more about you. Um, and I pray that everything you reveal to us is something that we can use, Abiyah, to be better servants and better vessels in your tabernacle if it be your holy will. In the name of Yahushua, Hamashiach, we ask all things, um, and we just humbly come before the throne, Abiyah, to give thanks for all things. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Shalom. Everybody have a good evening and sleep well. Yeah, little to all of y'all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.